Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds. When you look beyond the clouds towards the edge, you start seeing the magic. One of the people I got to know in the process is Tushar Khan. He started a very vibrant Slack channel to discuss AI, machine learning, cloud, anything under the sun. And it is amazing how much we learn from each other. Tushar, tell us a little bit about you. How did you become the Tushar Khan we know today? Sankar, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's both a pleasure and an honor to be here as part of your forum, communicating with 40,000 plus people across the world. Sankar, like everybody, you know, came from a humble background. My dad was an engineer in a public sector company in eastern part of India near Calcutta. We lived in Middle East for a brief while and then Bangalore. And after I was selected in IIT exams, I went to study in IIT BHU, studied electrical engineering. My passion for artificial intelligence started when I was in IIT. My undergrad thesis advisor was an ex-NASA research scientist, and uh, his recommendation brought me to U.S. after I worked under him in the area of artificial intelligence. To do my master's at University of Cincinnati, again in artificial intelligence, under an IIT Delhi alumnus, Dr. Raj Bhatnagar worked in U.S. Department of Defense projects and had publications in artificial intelligence. But 1999, when I was completing my master's, it was not the time for AI. So I worked as an engineer at Intel and Sun for six years and then took a break, went to New York, did a full-time MBA and became an investment banker on Wall Street and then worked in private equity. Spending some time there gave me a much broader idea of how businesses run, how CXOs think, how investments are made. At one point of time, I raised and invested $7 billion in private equity and $300 million in venture capital. But my heart was always in technology, so I came back to technology industry. I was hired by Sumit Dhawan, former president of VMware, who is now CEO of Proofpoint, and then went on to work at Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Twitter, Dell, EMC, building businesses in artificial intelligence in both private cloud and public cloud environment. Eight years back, me, a friend of mine, uh, Asis Bansal, who's currently at Google, we decided to basically bring together IITNs across the world, free of cost, to create an intellectual think tank, which has never been done before, focused in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we started WhatsApp and then Slack forum to bring in IITNs across the world. We have held events across every topic that you can think about in terms of both application of AI as well as technology-related AI. Right now, uh, we have close to 2,000 people who are part of our forum. That's my journey, Sankar. Wow, exciting. So when you started getting into AI like I did, it was the beginning of the AI winter. And we've seen multiple AI summers and winters from the times when people predicted that 1984 would be the end of the world, which never happened. And to now doomsday predictions as well. What's your take on this? The artificial intelligence, the word was coined in 1959 at a conference in Dartmouth. The whole Turing test came up during that period. And then AI has gone through a lot of ups and downs. A lot of research has been done over 50 years. It was kind of confined to academic circles and big research projects, defense initiatives. What changed the game was the advent of cloud computing. You cannot look at artificial intelligence separate from cloud computing. What cloud computing did was it democratized artificial intelligence by making compute and storage available to everybody at an affordable cost. So we need to thank Amazon Web Services, Google, and Microsoft, not just for giving us a tenant kind of access to expensive storage and compute, but also helping give a big push to artificial intelligence to go through the roof. And that has not changed the game forever. So since early 2010, 12, 13, it started happening. And then by 14, it really picked up where we have seen first analytics and then AI capturing the world. And the game completely changed last year. So LLMs and generative AI was in progress, was being worked upon since 2017, when the transformer-related paper called Attention is All You Need was published by Google. But then OpenAI came into picture. GPT-1, 2, and 3 were developed and released by 2021. Uh, then in 2022, when they made it public through chat GPT, it suddenly, you know, pushed up. So this is now an unstoppable force. And what is moving it forward and making it accessible to people is cloud computing. And now much better interfaces where we have gone from high specialized code to low code, no code environments. That's the direction we are going in. And it's for good. Recently, I was at a book launch event of a friend of mine from my forum. People were discussing, is this good or bad? 
and interesting enough my dad went to that particular book launch event and he made a very interesting comment that look this has been debated for a long time is science good or bad it depends upon how human beings use it so of course we'll have to put some brakes and checks but we're moving in the right direction in terms of democratizing both cloud computing storage compute and now artificial intelligence and intelligence across the world very true now one of the interesting ethical questions that has always come up tushar has been like you know the people who invented atomic energy also inadvertently ended up inventing atom bomb in other words technology can be used for all kinds of things now as an inventor it is very easy to say let me be ethics agnostic value agnostic what's your take on that i mean how much should an inventor and a discoverer worry about the ethical and responsible use of the technologies that they create i remember i was in ninth grade way back in 1987 88 i was participating in an elocution or debating competition in my school the topic was so india used its nuclear energy to build atom bombs and which india did but my position was india has a much bigger challenge at hand and that is energy and we should be using our nuclear energy to create power nuclear power not atom bombs but for lightening the homes and india had that capacity so people were inventing it right and by the way the person who invented for example e is equal to mc square albert einstein was not the person who was leading the manhattan project it was done by the powers to be the us president i think was franklin roosevelt and then oppenheimer who led that particular initiative which spent 2 billion dollars to create an atom bomb sankar the scientists the researchers need to be given a free mind in terms of what they want to develop how they want to develop how they want to take it to the next level is the job of the politicians the regulatory authorities the civil society to figure out how to make sure that this is all done under an ethical framework if we start chaining the thought process of the inventors themselves nothing good will come out right so we have to let that flow freely when it comes to its large scale deployment that's where the society needs to come in figure it out it's like people who are inventing cars we cannot put chains on their mind that your car can only run at 65 miles per hour let them build a car which can theoretically run at 200 miles an hour but then you put speed limits on the road and get the traffic police and system in place to make sure the society works that's the fine balance that we need to develop and each of them have to take their own responsibility very true we cannot just put shackles around uh, scientists and engineers and say now go develop it just doesn't seem to work another reason why there is so much confusion seems to be the word ai has been overused um i remember when i studied ai we studied neural networks but there were 100 neurons 200 neurons at the most today we have trillions right the other thing was most of them were directed heuristic algorithms for np hard problems uh, today that's not the case and then came expert systems and all could you kind of tell us what's different about ai from say the 60s to the 90s to now <clears throat> because they're not the same technology they're not even the same way of thinking about problems in many cases right sankar you have already answered the question yourself so let's look at your question and what you have laid out in context of our and cloud computing right so when you talked about neural networks which was the forefather of what is called deep learning so neural networks for example had certain number of layers on which you could run algorithms what cloud computing did is it allowed you to have much larger number of layers and it became deep learning the fundamental technology has remained the same the power of compute and storage has basically exponentially taken it to the next level where the depth of these networks have increased a lot that is the key that we have to understand the so neural networks have transformed them into deep learning there were a lot of statistical algorithms regression related algorithms which were there which have now come here the fundamental concept of training a model with some training data and then testing it and then releasing it has not changed it has remained the same what has happened is the scale at which it is being done has increased and thanks to cloud computing and easy availability of compute and storage that it has really made it much bigger now one paradigm shift which has happened with llms is that everybody does not need to worry about training model some large language models will be trained it has almost become like a utility company everybody does not need to generate electricity a bunch of utilities will generate electricity others will consume it large language models will be trained by a few players in the industry and rest of the people are going to use it for inferencing and if they have specific data on which they want to fine tune the model they can do fine tuning if they feel that the large language models are very generic then they can go with what is called prompt engineering 
and retrieval augmented generation. That's the gambit of things in which things have evolved. They have, to some extent, remained the same, but with more compute and storage, it has come in. There is always a need for creativity. Uh, there's always a need for intelligence and how we regulate it and work our way through that. That has not changed over time. Very true. Tushan, I find something very interesting about your career and journey. Most people go the reverse. They'll go with incubators, startups, and eventually land up with $7 billion under management. Something different you've done is you started off with large funds, and then you moved on to something that really connects to you, which is technology. Can you tell us what your metrics are in your journey? How do you measure your own success? My dad sent me an email in 2007 when I was graduating from Stern School of Business. He said there are two ways to lead life, outside in or inside out. Outside in means let's make as much money as we can. Then we'll figure out something interesting to work upon. And then we'll figure out how to have a good life. That's called outside in. Nothing wrong with it. There's something called inside out. Start leading a good life. Do something that you love and then money will come. When you reverse this particular metrics and a way of thinking, then you start doing things the way you want to. So at one point of time, I was passionate of working on Wall Street, which I did. But it was a good career and I might go back to Wall Street or might go back to investing again, which probably will happen. During my Wall Street career and after the financial crisis, when I came back to California and started working from here, my passion for technology also rekindled and I figured it out that along with ability to invest in technical knowledge, I also have a leadership ability to motivate people, to run organizations, to galvanize people through influence, not authority, and deliver results. And that prompted a new journey for me. And that has been a pretty satisfying journey over eight to nine years. So essentially for first six years after my master's, I was engineer. Then seven years after my MBA, I was working on investing in management and working with senior executive. I combined the two to pursue a leadership career in Silicon Valley. And going forward, I might combine my leadership career in Silicon Valley with my Wall Street experience to maybe pursue a career in investing, uh, raising an investing funds. I might do that again. I've kept things open and I've realized, Sankar, that as long as we're doing things passionately, making a difference, it works. And one thing I will tell you, whether it's about relationship with people or with organizations or career, no relationship is worth continuing if you do not love, live and grow in it. You need to love what you're doing. You need to live that thing every day. And then you grow as a person over a period of time. And some of that growth has to come internally first before you see externally and you work from there. Well said. In fact, I see that in your actions. When you started this group of people to discuss AI, it's been run very democratically. People participate, people bring in different angles. What motivated you to start the group and how has it grown over time? Two parts to it. Number one, I kept money and position out of this organization. So there are no formal positions to give to people other than two co-founders. We have never raised money for this. It is free for our ideas. When money and position goes away, politics remains away from an organization because there is nothing to clamor for. And second thing is we decided to give a voice to all our ideas. So I realized that I have a unique ability that I can work with some of the smartest people in the world and let them bring in their thought process and then me combining all of that together to move it forward. Since IITNs across the world got a voice, a platform of their own to express and think about their opinions, it just changed the game. It's free and open to IITNs, a Zoom-based call. We basically start with a thought process and then get everybody inclined around it. For a two-hour coffee chat, I typically end up preparing for five to six hours. And... That two hours of coffee chat gives you enough depth, almost equivalent to doing a semester-long course in a university. Think about 50, 60 ideas across the world coming and discussing something really threadbare deep into it. What comes out of it, I can't do it on my own. It's collective intelligence of ideas. There are two things which are required to move forward in your career. One is knowledge, other is network. We provide both to ideas free of cost. They get to learn from each other some of the smartest people in the world coming together, and they get a chance to know each other. And if you have these two things in place, naturally you grow through careers. And I get thanking emails from people all the time. People have hired each other from the forum. People have leveraged forum to post jobs, post resumes, got career breaks. And people who have participated, they have internally grown with their confidence to go and try something bigger and better. And then there is no unstoppable force. We have given them an environment to bring the best out of them and provided a nurturing environment 
free of cost. Initially, I used to campaign to grow the organization. When it came to 400, 700, now I don't have to. It's growing organically. It is 2000. It's like continuing education in many ways. Uh, but it's not just technical, but it's also the complete education that's needed. You're the Gen AI guy at Falcon X, which has a very unique model. Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's not my full-time job. Uh, it's something where I've been helping them set up what is called a Genetic AI Center of Excellence. I've known the founders of Falcon X, people who are associated with B.V. Jagdeesh, Raju Reddy, Raju Indukuri, Praveen Akiraju, Vivek Vipul, Murli Chilala, the whole gang for some time. I did an event with them on August 2nd, which they really loved. They know about the work that we have. And I wanted some kind of a platform where we can direct the energy enthusiasm of IITians in a very meaningful way. We decided to partner with Falcon X and bring our global IIT IML forum to work with Falcon X to move things forward. Along with Falcon X, I've also been involved with Thai Silicon Valley for a long period of time, uh, since 2015. And I was track chair for Cloud Track in 2016. Uh, security track in 2017, and artificial intelligence track in 18, 19, and 23. And with support of folks like you, uh, this year I got elected to Thai Silicon Valley Board of Directors for a two-year term. So Thai has been another organization with which I have been associated for a long period of time. I was a founding member of Thai. I was very fortunate to get guidance from the founders, Suhas Patel, uh, Jayashree Patel, Kanwal Rekhi. Without them, I probably would never have been an entrepreneur. Speaking of which, the kind of responsibilities you've taken to share, I thought you were full-time at Falcon X, but you could as well be full-time at Thai or doing this forum. How do you juggle between so many activities, yes. some of which had nothing to do with money? So, Sankar, here is the thing. My career is centered around right now helping businesses grow. I worked for Amazon Web Services for a long time. Uh, prior to that, I was at VMware, I said VM, Falcon X. Right now, I'm at Dell EMC, running an initiative spanning across four or five different companies, VMware, Intel, NVIDIA, and Dell, uh, building generative AI-related products in private cloud space and colo. See, all of these things are related to it. So for me, artificial intelligence working with the community is a passion. So when I work with these organizations, be it Thai or be it the IML Forum or with uh, you know Falcon X, I'm bringing and learning in this process. All of this essentially also helps me grow in my career, gives me insight, confidence to move things forward. They're all related to it. Now, of course, you also have to lead a very disciplined life. And since it's my career and journey, I'm going to share with you. You'll be surprised that in spite of living in Bangalore and going to an IIT and being on Wall Street in Silicon Valley, I have never smoked in my life. I have never touched alcohol. I don't drink tea and coffee. I hardly watch movies. I hardly do anything which can lead to habit formation. So I do not touch chess, even though I'm a good player and I do not touch cards. I'm not into parties. So I lead a very simple life. My life is still like the way my room was in IIT. If you go into my room in my IIT, you'll find everything to be very well organized. I will never take out a cert and put it somewhere. It will be on a hanger. The room was very neat and clean. A bunch of books. I was a national level debater. So macroeconomics is another area which I'm very good at. And that's it. No paintings, nothing much. Simple life, discipline, getting up, growing, doing things. That's what I have been. So there is a lot of discipline in my life, a lot of passion in my life. I love to know and work with highly intelligent people on things which are really good. It requires a lot of sacrifice, but then over a period of time, you find that to be your source of true happiness. You go from there. Nothing like being happy on whatever you work, and this is amazing. Uh, speaking of which, the intelligence that went into the cloud and got nurtured is now slowly trickling down to edge devices and not just in terms of edge uh, inferencing or edge optimization, but even learning is happening at the edge. What's going on and where do you see the future of AI and edge intelligence? A couple of years back, I gave a talk, part of a panel, which was in what is called federated learning. A lot of different ways to approach this. One way is if you look at a model, uh, an AI model, it's LLM or normal. It's essentially a bunch of neurons or nodes connected, right? You can represent that as an equation with a bunch of variables and weights. Now, you can run a model in a server at the central place, and then you can have edges where you basically do inferencing and use it. Or you can also have some learning going on at the nodes. 
and nodes actually sharing whatever they are learning with the one at the center, at the server or in the cloud. One way to do it is you get all the data, you send the data, and the central server basically runs it. Or you can train these models, keep training the models in isolation at endpoints, and what you send to the central server are the updated weights. So once you get the updated weights at the central server, you can update it. And that is the concept of federated learning. This is important because slowly and slowly, edge devices are going to become much more intelligent and powerful. A lot of data is out there. Another aspect of it is what is called data gravity and security. Sending data over to, let's say, a cloud provider or to some third-party entity, companies may not be comfortable with it, but they'll be more than happy to share their learnings in terms of updated model parameters, which others can also use to improve because they can all benefit from each other. That's the way it is. And by the way, therein also lies the power of our AIML forum for IITians. We never discuss anything confidential about any company, but we share thought process frameworks with each other. So you have people from Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, you name it, come to our forum, to our events. And, and then everybody, we are doing federated learning. Everybody's learning from each other. We're not looking at confidential data of the companies. And you train your mind over a period of time. Remember, Sankar, artificial intelligence is nothing but an attempt to mimic how human mind works, which it will never get to. But just as we do learning from others, it's called mosaic theory in financial investments. Federated learning concept is coming up, which will bring cloud and edge together, and the learning will happen on a continuous basis. Yeah, I agree. Everything we've done so far has mimicked the way humans learn, or maybe in future dolphins learn, or even uh, octopus learning. There are different mechanisms in some cases. So question for you. Neuromorphic computing has been the rage for quite some time, and so has quantum. How realistic are we in terms of getting neuromorphic? Because the brain models keep changing too. Understanding of the brain changes too. And how realistic is quantum? Completely different story again. First of all, I would like to honestly and humbly admit, and I'm not an expert in these areas, and neuromorphic computing is still new to me. Quantum computing is not. Around 12 years back, I had a meeting with the CEO of a company called D-Wave at one of the venture capital firms. The fundamental concept of quantum, uh, that is using m not just zero one, but a series of states being represented by a small number of you know bits is a game changing factor. We cannot have quantum computing come and change everything which is happening right now, let's say to artificial intelligence. The first place where probably it will make a change is in the efficiency of compute itself at a smaller scale. And then you'll have to slowly and slowly build it up over a period of time. You can look at some of the low-hanging fruits in terms of few specific algorithms, which can be enhanced in terms of the efficiency and output by looking at quantum computing and then go from there one step at a time. That's one part of it, which is technological part of it. Second part, which I have not looked at, is the cost part of it. You have to always look at what is called price performance, right? One of the reasons nuclear power, for example, has not taken off as much as it should is because the cost of generating nuclear power is pretty high compared to other sources, wind or solar, have become much cheaper now, along with the dangers that you have with nuclear power. In countries like India, nuclear power is still compatible with traditional sources of energy. So you'll have to look at the cost, the performance of the computing mechanism, along with the factors that we have in play and place. That's the way you will have to look at and work your way from. One of the things I'm perplexed about is that as we get into this very large scale federated learning, we have DPUs, we have GPUs, we have CPUs, we have AI processors. It is by definition heterogeneous compute, but each one is trying to excel in what they do. The bigger problem is not just whether you have fantastic memory, fantastic compute power or fantastic uh, parallel processing. It's the combination of all these. Are we doing anything to optimize the entire learning process, optimization process, inferencing process, or are we going to stay with this heterogeneous blocks of hardware, each one trying to excel in their own capacity? Sankar, it's a very good question, and let's step back and think. If you are having an AI over chai at your home, uh, and you want to basically have discussion on a topic, would we like to have everybody think in the same way or influence their thinking? Or we would like everybody to bring their unique perspective and combine it to come up with something which is very beautiful. That's how threaded learning will work. Each of these processing systems will be optimized for what they are working on, but we'll take updated models, mechanisms from each of these endpoints 
and basically feed that into creating what is called a super powerful model and systems. That's the angle and direction it will go with. So each of these things will get optimized on their own, but then they all will be brought together and then basically something great will come out of it. That's the way, because it's very tough. Just as we cannot control the minds of 40 people at your home, it's very tough to control what each of the corporations, entities, how they are working and thinking in terms of building their technologies. We have to work with whatever they have and then bring all of that together to basically extract the maximum value out of it. What we can do, though, is in order to ensure that inter uh, system communication, inter-process communication is working properly. We need to define some standards for communication standards, data processing standards. It's like the protocols that you define when you have people at your home for AI over chai. Yes, you can express your opinion, but you can't use abusive language, start attacking each other, maintain certain decorum. You define those things, something similar will have to be brought in here. I, I guess that's the only way we can proceed. As we talked about all these individual compute engines in their own ways will excel and bring something new to the table, but somehow we have to get them connected with each other. How important are the connectivity standards like ORAN, 5G, and the ability to virtualize the, the software-defined edge? Where do you think that's going? So one part is computing, which is being worked upon by some of the compute players. The networking industry is defined you know, a lot more dedicated by telcos of the world and other companies were trying to change it. Telcos have this Orion concept, open radio access network, and companies like VMware came up after acquisition of Nisera and other stuff, which was about starting with what is called network virtualization. And they've been working that area. These two trends are slowly and slowly going to intermingle. The good news is both of them can innovate orthogonal to each other. As long as your compute stuff is getting orthogonally developed, and then you have the communication stuff and standards which are orthogonally developed. A key thing which is happening is where these two things are converging. We have been working on software-defined networking, which became a paradigm for a long period of time. One big shift which has happened over the last 15 years, Sankar, is a separation of what is called data plane and control plane. So previously, both the intelligence and the compute power was in the hardware. What we are doing now slowly and slowly is to keep the compute, I would not call it dumb, but keeping all detailed processing there, but intelligence in the control plane. And that paradigm shift is going to continue because then you can much more easily update the control plane with new intelligence while hardware remains same, or you can even replace hardware, it becomes commoditized. And that's a good thing. Now, of course, this change is taking much longer than expected because a lot of vested interests in the industry would like the previous model to remain, but that's the direction it's going to move. The Compute related stuff is going to be innovated, but it's going to become much more commoditized with intelligence moving into the control plane. And that's how the whole networking connectivity industry is going to evolve over a period of time. That's what the open radio access network is also trying to achieve. I just talked to Sanjay Uppal of VMware, now Broadcom, and he was talking about how the, the car company is automating its factories using this idea of software defined edge, software defined factory. Do you think there will be many more such use cases where maybe software-defined uh, hospitals, all kinds of things will happen over time? Well, first of all, I deeply respect Sanjay Upal, who is, I think, your batchmate from IIT Bombay, along with Sekhar Ayer, whom I respect a lot. Sanjay and I never overlapped in VMware. He joined after I left. His company, VeloCloud, was acquired by VMware. But Sanjay certainly has a much more deeper insight into the direction in which the world is going. And he certainly is in a position where he can influence the direction in which the world is going. But the beautiful thing here is, you'll be surprised, uh, a lot of these industries, be it automotive, be it manufacturing, be it retail, a lot of these are going to go through a lot of transformations where things like software-defined networking or any place where you segregate data plane and control plane will come into picture at a very big force in a very big way. That's the angle which is going to happen. Now, how fast will this transformation be? We'll have to figure it out. You have to also remember, for some of these old industries, which are much more what I call bottom line driven in the sense that their margins are not that heavy. If you have to make big technology transformations, we have to also show them an ROI in a reasonable time frame, help them save cost or increase revenue. Something needs to happen for them to motivate them to bring about this change. That's where the holistic approach comes in or TCO analysis comes in. So those industries where you can easily find use cases for generating new sources of revenue or making drastic reductions in cost will first adopt these technologies compared to others where it might come on a later stage. Now, of course, financial services and healthcare are typically very cash rich. 
They have huge margins and they can tinker and play with technologies much before others can do. These industries like financial services, healthcare will be the first one to adopt. And then later on, retail, automotive, manufacturing, and others will come into play if they see compelling use cases to leverage this technology, uh, either to increase revenue or improve the bottom line. I'm sure, Tushar, with your vast experience, not only on Wall Street, but also on the technology front, lots of starry-eyed entrepreneurs must be coming to you, particularly technologists who have some new idea. What do you tell them if they really want to start a company? What are the things that they need to learn? or who they should surround themselves with to make it a real feasible company. I should give credit to this gentleman from IIT Madras, Kumar Ganpati, who gave me a framework to think on October 20th, 2016, when we had invited him for a panel discussion. Look at it as a two by two matrix, technology and market. And there are old and new, two different paradigms. So if you look at that particular uh, quadrant, there are four paradigms. Old market, old technology. That's what old companies do, right? You have an old market, you're just selling it there. You have old technology, new market. That's what established companies do. They have a technology, they try to go and enter into new markets. There's something called old market, new technology. That's where startups would go. Do not try to figure out how to create a new market. Look at existing markets and see how you can change the game using new technology. It's a very critical factor. Focus upon that. And then there is new technology, new market. You have to be Steve Jobs to succeed. It does not work that easily. So people a lot of times do this mistake that they think that they will develop a technology and change the behavior pattern of enterprises or consumers and create a market much easier than done. So that's the way you have to think. Think about existing markets and see how you can bring about a technology transformation. Second thing, start with a clue and then make a plan. Think about and talk to people about what are the challenges, what exactly are the missing pieces. And from that, come up with a product requirement. Instead of thinking in terms of a cool technology and expecting people to adopt the way you are. It's not like if you have a hammer in the hand, everything looks like an AM. That's not the direction you need to go. That's a different paradigm. That's a different direction in which you have to work through. So that's where it basically fits in. So make sure you're looking at the right old markets trying to transform it with new technology, look at some of the key product requirements, customer challenges that you can work with, then work backwards from there to figure out how you can bring about transformations. That's the way you have to look at. That's the way you'll have to work through. And it's not easy. A lot of these people who come to me are technologists by nature, and they feel that their company is not letting them do this, I will do this. That's not the right place to start. If your company is not letting you do something, maybe there is a reasonable, viable business reason. And I always tell people what your technology is to partner with people with a good business sense and come together. I learned this when I was in Intel in my early part of my career, where they had something called NBI, New Business Initiatives, where they let people work upon new ideas and sometimes they used to fund them and then nurture them. And they would always try to bring in a technologist with a marketing folk to bring together and work together. Intel still has a vibrant new business initiatives group, yes, incubator. Yes. Sundari Mitra used to run it until recently. I started my career on the Pentiums, bus functional model and DRAM controllers. I'm very fortunate that I got nurtured by some of the founders and founding team of Intel. Speaking of which, you and I grew up in times where technology was very rare. People hardly even had a regular phone line. The digital divide was huge in those days, and it still persists. When I go to rural Bihar, when I go to rural Mexico, out to rural Africa, very few people have access to technology. Therefore, the digital divide is still there. What's your prediction on how the digital divide will shift? When will it bring abundance to places where there's very little today? This is where public-private partnership needs to come into play. Government organizations, United Nations, they need to do the groundwork. First, infrastructure has to be put into place. Networking infrastructure has to be put in place. Electricity has to come in place. These are things which they need to do. And then create an environment where you can have profitable business models so that private organizations come and invest there. They don't want to come and create dams and you know, power plants to lighten up electricity in an area. The basic work will have to be done by governments. Now, they need to know where they need to stop. They should not start picking winners and choosers on the private side of the market or picking technologies at the latest stage. Let the markets do it. Let the capital markets do it, which do a reasonably good allocation of capital. Once that is done, you can invest into new companies, new technologies, and grow it over a period of time. That's the angle which we have to go with. 
that's the way these things have to come up and work your way through. The kind of solution you mentioned has worked extremely well in the United States and Western Europe. We also see other models like in China where a lot more centralization or Singapore. Do you think it's possible that centralized models where the government almost picks winners and losers, they also could succeed? Singapore is a very small country. Very easy to do things in a centralized manner. It's a government controlled and they have done it well. Now, China is an exception. You have to understand they don't have a democratically elected government. The party is the government. The government is the party. And it basically works. It has not worked in any other part of the world. Every other place where you have this kind of what I call pseudo dictatorship, it has gone into a chaos. Russia did not work. Other communist countries failed, right? And similarly, in other parts of Africa, dictatorship degenerates into basically looting the country. It just does not work. The model that India has is fairly good enough, which is what I think the rest of the world needs to replicate slowly and slowly. The government needs to provide the infrastructure, the facilities and stuff, and let the private forces come in. Let the investment come from outside. Some of the countries in Africa or other parts of the world where you have a challenge, even if they have some natural resources, there is not much flow of investment coming from outside. So what government needs to do is to leverage the natural resources that they have to build up the country, to make it an attractive destination for money and influence to come in and then take it from there. That's the way I look at it. The model that you have in Singapore has worked at a very small scale. China is just an exception. Replicating that kind of model somewhere else is extremely tough. It is not proven. The Berlin Wall fell down. The whole communist regimes went away, right? The Russia-Ukraine war is still going on. It has not worked anywhere else. Not a good model to basically try. You know, Tusharji, we have to have a separate conversation with you about Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. economics because you seem to have really gone into it deep understanding. There is, a, there is a reason behind it. I was growing up in India. I was in IIT, 93 to 97. India was going through the liberalization of economy, which started in 91 by Manmohan Singh. I was into debating and reading about this and going and participating in inter-IIT competitions. At one point of time in 94 December, I was about to board a train from Varanasi to Bombay to participate in Mudai. But unfortunately, I had to back out because my grandmother died. I've been to IIT Kanpur in Delhi. And since I'd spent years thinking and working and talking about these things, I have a reasonably good understanding of what kind of economic frameworks typically work. The government, political and economic frameworks are typically tied pretty close together. I think you would do great in public policy if you have not already done it. Understanding public-private partnerships is necessary even in the United States, even today. I did talk well, to Dr. I mean, Love Varshne who came up with the guidelines for President Joe Biden on how and how much to regulate AI. It's exciting. Is there any other concluding remarks you have for people who are listening? Many of the people who are listening here are either technologists or techno-curious decision makers. First of all, Sangar, thanks a lot for inviting me again to this particular forum. I love this kind of free flow conversations. A few things I would like people to think through. Number one, keep learning about new technology at whatever level you can. Everybody does not need to understand algorithms. You can learn it at the policy level, at the application level, at the use case level, but become familiar with this. That's the direction the world is going. Number two, whatever you're working upon, follow your passion. You will succeed to whatever extent you can and earn money, but you'll be happy at the end of the day. It's very curious, very important. And third, make the right choices of people with whom you basically network and talk to. Today, me and you are talking. I decided at one point of time to go ahead and run for Thai Silicon Valley Board of Director elections. We interacted and then I met you at the IIT Startups event. Now we are talking here and I'm pretty sure our relationship will go to the next level. We'll do many more things together. So make sure you're learning about new technology. You're doing things which you really love and network and work with people who are your like-minded. You can open a number of opportunities in life. I don't have a key to tell people how to make money, even though I worked in Wall Street, or else I would have figured that out myself. But it's a parameter which is very tough to measure, very dicey to chase, and uh, very tricky to accomplish. So focus on what you can and then go from there. I agree with you. It's a dicey parameter, just the dollar figure. Thank you for sharing many of these amazing things. And I know you go way beyond networking to creating deep, meaningful relationships with people around the world and especially the people that you work with. So thank you for that. And to people listening out there, this is why I talk to people. You never know what kind of insights you'll get. We are living in a very complex world. 
let's not make it any more complicated, but the complexity will not go away. How can we systematically go towards meaningful directions? So please come forward if you have ideas on the complexity as well as the chaos that you're encountering. Please let's talk about it and see how we can co-create a meaningful future. Thanks again, Tushar. It's really energizing to listen to you and understand things from multiple dimensions. Thank you, Sankar. It's a pleasure and honor to talk to a senior IIT alumni like yours. It's blessing advice and guidance of people like you and people in your generation, your friends that has actually helped us move forward.